help with the foundation of knowledge and um, start laying some groundwork for some of the things that we're going to be uh, advocating for this session. So without further ado, because we are going to have to have a hard stop at 5.15, I'll be keeping an eye on the time. I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. And again, because um, it will allow, so if you have questions as people are presenting, just feel free to raise your hand and we'll make it as interactive as possible. So with that, Commissioner Harrington. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Harrington. I'm the commissioner for the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, good to see some familiar faces in here. Uh, for those uh, that I haven't met before, I look forward to connecting with you after uh, today's session. Just by way of background, the Department of Labor covers areas like unemployment insurance, uh, workplace rights, uh, workplace safety, uh, workers' compensation, and then two areas today really around workforce, uh, which we'll be talking a lot about. But more of the presentation that I have for us today is around workforce data. Uh, and so as we're talking about the fact that we need to make meaningful change in the area of how we approach Vermont's labor force and our workforce, uh, we need to understand the issue, why we have dissatisfaction with where we are right now and the vision and where we want to go. Uh, and there's no better way to do that uh, than to better understand the current state of play. Um, we're going to talk about the population and how that boils down into Vermont's workforce and also the challenge that we see. One of the things I'd ask you to do is just as we're, as I'm going through these slides here, in your mind, I'd like for you to envision a bucket. And in that bucket, there's water being poured into the bucket but there's also holes in the bucket and the water is dripping out of the bucket. All right, now just hold that in your mind as we go through this. Um, this information comes from a variety of different sources, uh, but it was uh, mainly came out of our economic and labor market information division. So when we talk about Vermont's labor force, our total labor force is about 336,800. When we talk about how much of that labor force is actually participating in the labor force, it's 61.7%. We'll talk more about what's known as the labor force participation rate, uh, that 61.7. Uh, um, when we look at the number of open jobs in our labor force, we have about 23,000 open jobs. Uh, and when we look at our payroll, which is actually filled jobs, we have 302,100. That um, does not include self-employed and unemployed individuals. So you may say, okay, why does our labor force have 336,000 people in it, but our payroll only has 302,000 people in it? And that's the discrepancy there. Vermont's unemployment rate is currently at 2.5%, and the number of unemployed people in Vermont is at 8.4 thousand people. Uh, and just so you know, for, for we'll get into the numbers on a trend, uh, scale, but um, both our unemployment rate and the number of unemployed uh, people in Vermont is at a historic low. Wait, Commissioner, before you go back, because to really hone in on that, there's 23,000 open jobs, but only 8.4 or 8,000 unemployed people. So, Correct. So, even if we, and that's assuming every unemployed person in the state had the right skills and lived in the right location, uh, if we were able to uh, put them back to work, uh, and um, we still would be not even halfway through the number of available jobs that uh, we have open. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that ratio looks like. So when we talk about Vermont's population, uh, some of this is based on new census information, which that uh, data is still being called through by the US Census Bureau. So we don't have the final releases of all that information, but we do know that Vermont's population increased to 647,064. Again, our labor force is only a, a portion of that total number at 336,800. And then when we look at our labor force, we actually look at what is that prime working age, and that is defined by 25 to 54 year olds. Uh, so of the 336,000, 202,800 are within that prime working age. Within our population, there are, uh, it's 50.3% female. It is 18.1% under the age of 18. 20.6% uh, are 65 and older, uh, and again, 61.3% are between the age of 18 and 65. 
here in Vermont, 11 out of the 14 counties had population growth when we looked at the census. However, none of them saw labor force growth. So again, when we look at these numbers, envisioning uh, how many uh, within our population are under the age of 18 and will be entering our workforce, and then obviously those who are aging out the 65 and older. Uh, and so again, those create uh, a number of uh, concerning measures for us. And I see there's a question back. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make sure I knew the folks that are in the labor force. Sure. What age does it start at? Male, female, what age does it start at? What do you yeah. consider your age? So uh, there's another slide on here when we talk about the labor force participation rate and what that trend has looked like. So you age into the labor force at 18. Uh, but you never age out of the labor force. So one of the things you'll see in that data is that our labor force participation rate has declined over the years. We can surmise that much of that is related to people um, getting older in Vermont. Uh, and we recognize that with Vermont's uh, aging uh, population that creates a challenge for our labor force participation rate. You can see the numbers up here better than I can see the numbers over there, but when we look at Vermont's labor force, uh, this just looks back at 2005 to 2021. Uh, you can see that we uh, saw that decrease in our labor force beginning in 2020 and uh, in 2021. Um, what I will point out is that the dip that you see between 2012 and 2017, uh, the way our economist typically explains this to me is, Every 10 years when the Census Bureau does the census, for each year after that, they make an estimation or a projection. And so the further you get away from that point in time, the uh, margin of error grows. Uh, so we are likely, once they release the revised 2022 census information, we're likely to see a revision there. Will that that um, little blip down uh, will actually probably ba balance out, and that's what we're expecting. Um, but again, you see the significant decrease, and we'll talk about, often we hear that question of where did everybody go? Uh, and we know that uh, a lot of uh, that had to do with, uh, one, retirements, so either early retirements, uh, or people who are at retirement age, or people who are beyond retirement, but had stayed in the workforce and then decided to use uh, the pandemic as a, as a time to exit the workforce. We also know that a number of individuals made decisions um, to leave the workforce, maybe to care for a loved one or move from a, a dual income household to a single income household. When we look at our labor force peak, uh, we're talking about uh, the number, the ratio of open jobs to unemployed persons. Uh, and so if you imagine that that kind of one-to-one -one is the sweet spot, so for every one person, there's one job available, you can see that we've hovered around the one mark for quite a while. Uh, and you can see with the pandemic in March of 20, and then uh, a significant increase heading into 21 and 22. And again, uh, with the current rate, we're looking at about a three to one. So for every one unemployed individual, uh, there are three available jobs. The concerning piece for us, and we're not there yet, and so um, we often hear about uh, large layoffs that might occur across the state. And, and at this point, um, the, the saving grace in all of that is there's still a significant number of jobs available across our state. But what we do uh, be track is where those numbers intersect. So again, where do we get to where the number of unemployed individuals begins to outpace the number of available jobs? And that's where um, we, we will see a concern. When we look at uh, the rate of change uh, from the last uh, census, you can see that um, we had peak labor force uh, in a variety of different years by county. But again, like I said on the, the first slide, um, all of those counties have seen a decrease in their labor force uh, over the past 10 years. Feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions. Um, this, again, talks to that labor force participation rate, which we, we just discussed. But uh, really, um, the, the piece I want to point out here, just as a way, matter of course, is that it looks like uh, a steep uh, decline, which it is. Um, but just point out that we're talking about um, a, a shorter percentage because the graph only goes from 60% to 70%.
So again, traditionally Vermont over the years has hovered um, above 70 for a number of years. And then uh, in 2010, uh, again, probably uh, likely following the Great Recession, we saw the labor force participation rate uh, begin to decline. Uh, and then we saw the steep decline uh, coming out of uh, the pandemic, which again, uh, we often hear the word, the, the great resignation. Uh, and uh, again, that typically for us has equaled retirements or uh, people who left uh, the workforce um, due to some other reason, uh, specifically to care for maybe a, a child or an aging loved one. This is just a look at Vermont's trend in unemployment uh, from uh, 2007 to current day. Um, but really, I just want to point out, I wanted you to see Vermont by itself um, so that then we could contrast it against other states in New England. So you can see that in, on, uh, on balance, we are relatively similar across the entire uh, New England region. However, I will point out that Vermont has been uh, traditionally on the lower end and has fared better when it comes to our unemployment rate. So our unemployment rate has traditionally been uh, one of the lowest in New England. When we look at percent uh, change in payroll jobs, so again, this is not uh, the, just to point out the graph. So across, um, the horizontal axis, we're looking at years, everything from December of 2007 to August of 2021. On the left-hand side of the vertical axis, uh, we're looking at just the change in the payroll workforce. So again, if we start at zero, which uh, brings us back uh, before the last recession, what we saw was the decline uh, in payroll uh, jobs and then an increase in 20. Uh, uh, passing the zero mark in 2013. Uh, and again, um, you can see that Vermont uh, did not uh, suffer as significantly during the Great Recession. However, our rebound also was not as significant heading into the pandemic. And then uh, you see the, the significant impact that the pandemic had on uh, Vermont's uh, payroll jobs. I also want to point out, and uh, we'll one thing here is that this is jobs filled. So this doesn't include available jobs. We're just talking about payroll jobs. So again, uh, jobs that are currently filled where individuals are earning uh, wages, but this doesn't tell the whole story. And what I really wanna highlight is this next page. And so a lot of what you'll hear us talk about here today is the fact that um, we've got essentially the story of two Vermonts, right? Uh, our um, metropolitan area or capital region and the rest of Vermont. And so when we look at this slide, we've broken it out by Vermont, the Burlington uh, metropolitan area, and then the rest of Vermont excluding Burlington. Again, so the green line is Vermont, which is the previous slide. But then when we look at these two trends, all of the growth that we saw from the last recession uh, predominantly occurred in the Burlington metropolitan area. Uh, and then, but we saw an even significant, um, more significant decline in all of the areas outside of the Burlington metropolitan area when we talk about job loss uh, from the pandemic. I wanna just, pause here because I'm about to wrap up, but in the beginning, I had asked you to think about that bucket with the water pouring into it and the water dripping out of the holes. And so when we talk about what are the challenges that face Vermont right now with regards to our workforce and what are the, um, the initiatives and projects and actions we're looking to take moving forward to reverse that workforce trend, I often equate it to that leaky bucket. So if the bucket is Vermont's economy and the water being poured into the bucket are new workers, right? So they're either workers that live here and are graduating either from high school or college or maybe from a training program, uh, but also individuals we are recruiting uh, to Vermont as well. When we think about how do we fill that bucket, we can't just continue to put new people into the bucket. Right. We also have to talk about how do we flood that bucket. And I often consider those holes the barriers to employment. So what are the things that either prevent people from entering Vermont's workforce 
or what are those things that are causing workers to leave Vermont's workforce? And so you'll hear a lot of the initiatives going forward, um, not just on how do we train and upskill Vermonters to fit the needs of our employers, but what are the actions we're taking um, to encourage people to stay in Vermont? So whether it's uh, challenges around housing or childcare uh, or affordability, those are all areas where I would consider them holes in our bucket that, that need to be filled. So again, it has to be a dual approach, not only pouring water in, but how do we how do we patch the holes um, in order to fill the bucket? So with that, I will wrap up by saying um, every two years we put out this brochure. It's a partnership with the McClure Foundation, Vermont's most promising jobs. We have a box of them over there, so we'll make sure to hand those out or grab one before you leave. Uh, and then uh, going forward, if you have questions about uh, labor market information data within your maybe your specific region or area of interest, uh, Matthew Barowitz is our chief economist and division director within uh, the economic and labor market information division. And Cameron Woods sitting over there uh, is our policy and legislative director. So if you have questions and want data around your region or area, you can go through Cameron and he'll make sure to connect you with Matt. Yes. Hi, Jeff Austin, Good evening. Um, so, I mean, I'm just reading the paper that Beta, the electric airplane manufacturer is going to be hiring hundreds of jobs. And then there's like a chip maker for satellites at ULA that's going to be uh, needing hundreds of jobs. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, I'm concerned that they won't be able to find them. And uh, I'm just, is there some, and I maybe um, Secretary uh, French can talk about this in terms of coordinating with UEF and uh, Vermont, you know, the Vermont uh, University, and you know, just kind of having like a pipeline, you mm -hmm. know, from these colleges to these businesses that are very excited and will be hiring. Yeah, and I'll, uh, two of the presenters here, um, Secretary French and uh, Director Bayon uh who is the head of our state workforce board, um, uh, are intimately engaged with how do we coordinate and how do we align our resources and our efforts so that there is a pipeline uh, and it's not disjointed. Uh, we're not working at cross purposes. I, I do think the, the challenge we face is one at the national level. Uh, and so we are constantly having that conversation of how does Vermont differentiate itself because every other state would share something similar to this if they were giving a presentation in terms of workforce. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about that, identifying our strengths and, and how to really highlight and build off of those strengths is, is key. Any other? Yes, ma'am. So uh, of the 22,000 open jobs, what do you know that area that so what I should have pointed out on that first slide with all the numbers, um, most of those numbers are statistical numbers based on a survey sample conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau that goes through the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the federal level, and then our team uh, uses that data. So again, it's it's a sample size, it's a statistical number, not necessarily we know each and every one of those 23,000 jobs and where they're located. Um, there is some sub data that comes in terms of where those jobs are located, but not necessarily by employer. Um, what we do know is the state um, out of the Department of Labor operates uh, a, a job board, you know, similar to like uh, monster.com uh, or Indeed. Um, and so our state job board, which um, is a requirement under the federal government, but um, what we saw is a significant uptick um, for a variety of different reasons. But during the pandemic, we usually had anywhere from 18 to 20,000 jobs posted on there. Uh, I think we're, we've actually seen a, de a decrease, which is not surprising uh, where we are now. Um, being around anywhere from 11 to 13,000 uh, job postings. So from that data, we are able to identify not just the sector they're in, 
um, but where are they located and, and what are the employers looking uh, for talent? Um, but there are a number that are often engaged with our agency of commerce and community development um, with regards to uh, how do they how do they grow their business uh, here in Vermont. And so we often work closely with ACCD on how do we link up from the employer side and uh, the talent side um, to meet the needs of the employer. Um, okay. And the second pitch, I want to say your question hit the nail on the head. Um, when we see the low employment rate, that's something a lot of people celebrate, and it is a good thing. But the flip side of that is if you're an employer and you're looking at growing a business in Vermont, like there's no bench, right? Like there's a very low employment rate. So, where am I going to find the employees um, to fill these potential uh, positions that I'm creating? And one of the things we'll talk about more too in terms of like how do we solve this this issue, right? We have really specific workforce programs, um, but there's also things we should recognize around childcare, housing, affordability, right? Other quality of life issues that will make Vermont a place that families want to be and that families want to stay. And we'll hit on a few of those things too as we go along around the pipeline question that you raised um, between Tori and Secretary French here in a moment. Um, so this was a helpful uh, kind of table setting to see the context in which we are working in right now and some of the work that we need to do this week to sustain ourselves. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Secretary French to talk about um, the administration's uh, vision for cradle to career continuum <coughs> in terms of how do we try to expand our labor force um, starting with our earliest assets, you know, our kids, and then Tori will continue the conversation in terms of higher education and training. All right, Secretary French. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, I'm joined today, uh, Deputy Secretary Kevin Boucher is there. Uh, also, Ted Fisher, you might recognize the State House as our Communications and Legislative Affairs Director. Um, to Representative Austin, your prompt and Kendall's comment. Uh, whoop, just hit something there. No, I totally do that. It's been a long time since I've been in the classroom with a pointer and then <laughs> the right one should be Laurel. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can help him in here. I broke it already. That's great. I'm also known as being a technologist, so it's, it's, it's really exciting. <laughs> Thank you. The um, this point of in the title here of unifying cradle to career. Um, you know, I'm sure you're acquainted with Governor Scott's vision in that regard. Uh, it's not an uncommon vision. Uh, certainly, I think today, you know, looking at the labor uh, market context that we're operating in Vermont, education often sits at the intersection of a lot of policy. It's not just when you think traditionally about education. I think you know everyone's either been to school or driven by a school. Um, we increasingly across the world acknowledge that education is critical not only for its sort of traditional role of helping individuals uh, reach their maximum potential, um, but also in the social and economic development of a state or a country. Uh, so it's it's a really critical piece of policy. So unlike um, my colleague's presentation on statistics, I'm mostly going to talk about policy uh, themes. <clears throat> so when we think about themes in education, you know, you have policy goals, as Kendall, Kendall mentioned, they break out, I think, in three easy to understand buckets. Um, this idea that we want to get every child off to a good start um, so they can be successful in school. The idea of creating greater flexibility and options um, in the middle of the process and exploring pathways, and then ultimately helping uh, individuals transition to the workforce and be happy and productive citizens. So we think about getting kids off to a good start. This is where, again, the education, I should say the agency of education, probably 90% of our function is to uh, supervise and regulate the K-12 system. Uh, but we, we touch on elements of policy on either end of the, that process. So getting kids off to a good start, uh, this is where the priority on child care and pre-K emerges. As you know, we've made significant investments in child care, uh, continues to remain a priority. How child care and pre-K come together has been a topic of some deliberation over the years, and I think Vermont's a national leader in that regard. But it's, it's really critical that we focus on the foundation of the education system, if we don't make gains in the, that important sort of milestone, if you will, the rest is really challenging, becomes more challenging. So it's a critical piece. 
Uh, number two, this idea of flexibility, um, you know, probably more critical than ever. I think this also, if I were to describe education the last 50 years or so, we could see this acknowledgement of education being important for social and economic development. But I think this idea that uh, society and the dynamic nature of our economies has become more complex. Uh, we have statistics about people changing jobs more often. I don't know about you, uh, but you know, I, I certainly have explored several different career paths in my life. But the idea of giving students options, and what does that mean in a rural state like Vermont, where some students are able to explore options more so than others? Uh, but the idea is that, you know, if you're making a decision on what you want to do with your life, you have to be open to exploring other options later on. So the idea of allowing people to move flexibly and been in, um, among and between options, particularly when we start talking about issues of career and technical education, higher education, and so forth, um, we need to be open to the idea that adult education is a critical, critical part of our strategy. Um, and then certainly, lastly, supporting uh, the transition to the workforce um, and ensuring that we have a successful democracy, which really means people being happy and productive. So these sort of broad brush uh, policy goals. Um, I also want to talk a bit about structures because as much as this sounds like a unifying narrative uh, for policy, um, I just want to acknowledge that we, we try to approach this uh, through a variety of structures. And this is where it gets really challenging. And I think uh, one of the more complex policy spaces in the state house is education. Uh, firstly, we have different agencies regulating different parts of the system. Um, I call it, you know, child care and pre-K is an example where my, our partner agency and agency of human services plays a pivotal role. Um, we have similar kinds of relationships with Department of Labor and other agencies on CTE and higher education. So just an acknowledgement that um, education policy is enacted across multiple state agencies and departments. Uh, secondly, uh, the K-12 system itself, if we just contemplated K-12 as a standalone entity in Vermont, um, that is structured in a very complex way in Vermont. There's certainly the state-local partnership, uh, but the local partnership itself is articulated in lots of different ways. We have different configurations of our governance structure. I'm sure you're familiar with Act 46, uh, but there's a lot of different configurations. Uh, when we look at school districts in terms of like ecosystems, if I were to describe to you what North Country Supervisory Union does in Newport and compare that to what Addison Central Supervisory Union District does in Middlebury, they look kind of similar, but how they do things actually is quite different on a daily basis. Um, thirdly, you know, the issue of CT, adult ed, higher ed, um, this needs tighter integration. and They're not necessarily set up to talk together that very, very well. So uh, just keep harping on Representative Austin's point. Uh, this is an area where we need to get much more intentional. I think uh, what I've noticed in the last few years is there's a growing acknowledgement uh, that the CT in particular is a critical asset from a policy perspective. Uh, certainly, this is a priority of the governors, uh, but CT uh, has federal funding behind it. We can do a lot to kindle student aspirations with much much younger grades. We can certainly do more to promote the value of CT. Uh, if you haven't been to a CT center, I would encourage you to go out and visit one. It's, it's really quite uh, quite amazing when you see these facilities in action. Uh, but again, to, to think about CT uh, in the context of adult education and higher education, I think it's a critical piece. It's not either or. It's really about people having the ability to move in among these options, uh, not just in K-12, but through their adulthood. Um, and lastly, uh, and I would love the opportunity to speak to legislators about this. It's just an observation. Um, we actually, I think, do a fairly good job of collaborating inside of state government around some of these complex uh, areas of policy. Uh, but when we go into the state house, there's a lot of siloization of these policy concepts. So for example, pre-K, child care, different committees involved. Um, so it's hard, and this will be a challenge for us going forward, is we can envision policy to be enacted in the field, if you will, out in our communities that's considered on an integrated basis. But we really need to think about how we design that policy inside our policymaking process inside the state house to make sure uh, that we're able to focus on outcomes that we want to see, that we're measuring for those outcomes, and that um, we're holding the system accountable uh, for those outcomes. So at any rate, it's important as we talk about this idea of unification in the policy area, to acknowledge that there, there are some structural aspects to this that make it more challenging, perhaps, than some other areas. Feel free to ask me questions as I go on. Um, so I think, you know, that being said, that's sort of the context. I want to acknowledge that we've uh, really worked well together during the pandemic uh, with, with the General Assembly, um, and the pandemic stands out to me as a great example of, um, you know, how we can work together, not only across these structures, 
uh, but through some very complex regulatory uh, situations to accomplish what we need to do for kids. Um, right now, there's an unprecedented number of dollars, and I'll talk more specifically, uh, flowing through the education system. Um, we basically have a two-year period to make the best use of that money that we can. And I'll talk more specifically about that in a minute, because that's, that's on the forefront of every school district in the state right now. Uh, not just the money, but the work they need to do uh, to meet the kids, uh, the needs of kids as a result of the pandemic. Uh, secondly, you know, when we were contemplating how to put together a plan to spend this federal money, uh, we worked very closely with the General Assembly to do that. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the highlights of that planning here today. Uh, but you should know there is an education recovery plan, essentially, a state plan. It's on our website. Uh, a lot of the elements of that plan were enacted through the work of the General Assembly. So we have a very coherent, uh, integrated approach to doing this education recovery work. It was exceedingly hard to put this together, uh, but I think it's going to serve us well in the next couple of years. Um, and we, we also had some work the General Assembly charged us with to strengthen the regulatory approach in K-12 education. Actually, um, when I was a superintendent, I never would get excited about the idea of new regulation. Uh, but I think this was long overdue, and I'm excited to say that we're going to be strengthening um, in particular, our quality assurance regulations in education that should help. Uh, I don't want to use the word drive improvement, but um, we need to we need to think about strengthening the structure of our K-12 system. And that really gets to the ideas of, you know, what is local control? What is the state responsibility? Um, and we have the opportunity, I think, as a state, more so than other states, to really uh, lean into that partnership of local control versus state uh, responsibility and make it a very successful education system, if not the best in the country. So in terms of the uh, recovery work in particular and some of this opportunity, um, approximately $442 million has been flowing through the education system, the K-12 education system, uh, to address uh, student needs during the pandemic. The bulk of that, about $283 million, is really available for this idea of recovery. Uh, when we were doing our recovery planning, we basically determined to focus on three issues. And these, these three priorities are really um, the guide, guideposts, if you will, of a lot of investment that's going on inside the education system. Uh, we have an elaborate visualization of the data. If you're wondering what your district is spending on, uh, you can go in there and you can, you can see across the state how people are leveraging these dollars. I will say this, this money, the $442 million, 90% of that is controlled by local school districts. So when we talk about what the state's doing with money, it's important to acknowledge that we have the 10% of the, the, the pot of money. But the three buckets, uh, particularly in year one of the pandemic, you, you certainly remember uh, we literally had to shut down the K-12 system overnight and go fully remote. And after that first year, the priority was re-engagement, how to, how to get reestablish the connections with kids and their communities. So we made a significant investment in that year one um, in summer and after school programs. Very successful collaboration, public-private partnership, uh, which is necessary to enact these types of programs across the state. Uh, but it was the campaign was called Summer Matters. You might remember that. It was really, I think, an important first step in heading into recovery. Now that our schools are back open this year, knock on wood, is going uh, more or less normal, um, as much as it can be normal in this context. Really, the focus of the recovery shifts to two other areas. One are academics and the other are social emotional needs. And I list some of the discrete investments that are being made in those areas, uh, but I thought I'd also just sort of highlight some of the data behind this. So one of the things uh, we did uh, very early on is we contemplated making these unprecedented investments in our education system. We wanted to establish some metrics right up front to, to measure how are we doing, you know, like what's the need out there. So in terms of um, sort of, I'll call them baseline indicators, and starting with the academics, uh, we knew we, the money goes away in two years, so we have to make an impact in two years. Uh, the decision uh, we had to make right up front was, do we have the time to create new measures? And it takes a lot of time to do anything in education, and we decided right off that we didn't have the time to create new measures. So we, we fell back on the measures that we already have. This means the state assessments that we do on an annual basis in schools, uh, you might be familiar with the term SBAC. Uh, so every, every uh, school administers a test at the end of the school year. Um, we decide to use those as a measure uh, as we get into the recovery work. <clears throat> and also we have a national assessment. It's really the only assessment given across the country that every state participates in. It's called NAEP, uh, the National Assessment of Education Progress. So uh, we're looking at these data and uh, what, what's coming up behind me here in a second. No, oh, it's behind me. There it is. 
um, is sort of uh, how we call these the initial results of the end of the school year last year. Now, it's important to acknowledge that um, testing has been imperfect. The conditions for testing have been imperfect the last couple of years. And indeed, in one year of the pandemic, the federal government canceled the testing altogether due to the pandemic. Last year, participation was different than it is in a, in a pre-pandemic situation. Uh, but these results more or less conform to where uh, Vermont has been performing historically. Um, you know, these when you see things like the 40% proficient rates, when you look at these test scores around the country, you'll see a lot of states scoring in that area. Uh, we're not satisfied uh, with this performance level, but essentially this is our baseline data as we begin this intensive period of work in the next two years. We're hoping to, to move the bar, if you will, on student academic performance. Sure. Does anyone have questions about anything education recovery space or testing scores? Because I realize we just gave you a lot of information and you might want to react to your preferences. Sure. Yes. Uh, who sets the, the uh, percentages on this? Uh, it, it seems that it might be uh, a little skewed to be an unrealistic. Right. Maybe. Yeah. I, I, when I see this, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think the way to look at it in the context of this conversation is not is forty percent a fair measure or not. It's just to say, regardless, this is our baseline as we begin this intensive two year period of investment. Uh, but to your question, uh, the the cutoffs, you know, we work with large testing companies, the vendors who build these assessments. They certainly have psychometricians who you know look at those things. But as a state, we have the opportunity. Uh, to determine the cutoff scores of where these things are. Uh, but they are, I would say, somewhat arbitrary, and it's a point of concern. However, when we look at, uh, you know, this is why the issue of the NAEP data is important. This is the national assessment, and these cutoffs are determined at the national level. So we look for this not necessarily as a correlation, but just to say, you know, to your point, can we look at the SBAC data and be concerned with, you know, true sense of concern that we look at the NAEP data and we see similar patterns? I think it's also important to acknowledge that if we were to un spend more time with you and unpack these results, you would see discrepancies based on the type of kids. You know, there's not all kids are achieving at 40%. This is sort of like an average, if you will. Um, for example, when I was superintendent, I remember eighth grade uh, students, every single girl was proficient in, in eighth grade in writing. But when we started to unpack the scores, we found it was the male students that were not doing as well special ed students, students in poverty, those are the ones that were struggling. And what we see in the national data of NAEP is, is really the story here, not only the performance level, but when we start to unpack the level, is this, those students that are at more risk are at more risk now because of the pandemic than they ever were before. And that's, that's one of the reasons when we start talking about investment strategies, we have to be really interested in those students that are at risk, more so than before. Yeah, uh, there are two different ways of testing in these things. Uh, of where you are, sure. where your registration is based on the total, like the 95 percentile, or, and I can't remember what the other is, depending on what percentile ranks. Standard, it's more of what you've learned. Yeah, this would be a long briefing on this, and uh, but I would say typically we would use this kind of presentation for something like percentile ranks, and then proficiency would be the other measure. Perfect. Yeah. But uh, if you're interested in this topic of understanding the assessment conversation, we could set up a dedicated briefing to you on that. Again, for today's purposes, I know this is a lot of information, um, but as we were contemplating, um, you know, we're in this unprecedented moment. We don't, we don't have any experience on how to deal with a, a global pandemic and shutting down our school system. We had to make some decisions around what are the priorities? How do we measure them? So we fell back on, on some of the measures that we already had. Um, and similarly, we had to create some measures for the social emotional needs of students. So this is an area where we're, we're really just developing this. This is, we work with a, our partners at AHS to kind of understand what do we already have for data? Um, because we hear a lot from schools about anxiety levels of students, the behaviors, a lot of concern about the impact of the pandemic from a social emotional perspective. So this is just a list of some of the metrics that we're beginning to track. Again, these are examples of metrics that we already had in our portfolio of metrics. But just to let you know, as we're, we're thinking about, um, are these investments going to be successful or not? We're really looking at a series of measures. Um, this is really good. Here we go. 
uh, we're looking at a series of measures that um, allow us to focus on academics and social emotional needs. Those are the two big domains of activity. So all that being said, the other aspect of the recovery, I think when we think about this money, there's two things we think about inside the administration. One is we need to address the needs of kids in our schools as a result of the pandemic. And so there's, there's immediate needs that we need to, to address. The second point is we need to, as much as possible, because these are one-time funds, focus on strategic things that can help improve the education system after the funds are gone. So it's a mixture of both things. One, we wanna deal with the immediate needs of kids, which we're thinking of in terms of academics and social emotional needs. But we're also trying to make strategic investments that will improve the education system after the federal money is gone. So what's left of the landscape after the federal the recovery period is over. So first one, uh, again, CT important tool or lever we can pull on. Uh, the governor has been targeting the year money, which is another source of money we've had in recovery to really put significant emphasis on CT. We invite you to uh, share that priority with us. Uh, this is meant um, we'll start to see more on this. We're doing a major CT marketing campaign to really get the word out about CT. Um, you know, CT is for all kids. It's not for some kids and not others. It's really for everyone. Uh, we're investing in uh, innovative programs. You know, someone mentioned beta technology. We're uh, putting money into electric vehicle, uh, innovative programs and housing redevelopment. Um, and we're also, a big, big thing I was gonna call out here is uh, focusing on the CT funding system as a priority. So. Uh, we have uh, JFO's commission to study of CT funding. Um, we The theme here is we want to eliminate barriers that might prevent kids from accessing the system. We think the CT funding system might create some disincentive. So JFO, that report will come back at some point during the legislative session. We hope to uh, turn that into some sort of legislative action relative to improving the structure of the CT funding system. Um, we're doing a major analysis of education workforce. This is being done by an outfit out of Colorado. Um, they're the same folks that are working on the CT funding analysis, uh, but we'll have that report coming back sometime mid, mid session that will tell us, you know, what, it, what is the condition of our education workforce? Uh, the pandemic hasn't been the best recruitment tool in education. Um, and it does, as I travel around the state this fall, it varies considerably from area to area. So not, um, every district in the state is, uh, has a lot of vacancies, but everyone has very shallow recruitment pools right now, for sure. So we want to understand that and quantify it and try to surface some policy uh, recommendations to help improve recruitment and retention of our teachers, making a significant investment in educator wellness, because uh, those the people in the classroom that are doing work with our kids need to be in a good place themselves to do that work. Made significant investments in after school, you know, again, anticipating wrapping services around kids, whether it be social or academic needs. Um, after school can be a huge uh, opportunity for us to make some progress. So we've been focused on making those investments, but ensuring that um, that can happen in all areas of the state. So a lot of the theme of our policy is to, to examine each ecosystem, if you will, the state, and ensure whatever we do through a public-private partnership or through our investments, that we're uh, not leaving people behind. Uh, we, we still need to double down on remote learning capacity. Uh, it's not it was something we utilized in the state sort of sporadically prior to the pandemic. Uh, but as a rural state, if we're going to offer a true 21st century expansive learning curriculum for kids, all kids in the state, we need to have robust uh, virtual learning capacity. So we've been making investments in our Vermont virtual learning uh, cooperative. Uh, we think we can do a lot more in this space. Uh, our school facilities improvement, we've been leveraging recovery dollars to make some progress on a lot of the deferred maintenance issues. Uh, I know you're familiar with the PCB issue. I've been thinking about the nexus of PCBs and, and some of this work is indoor air quality. So our districts have really been focusing on making improvements in indoor air quality issues, uh, but we have a lot of work to do in facilities and districts have been leveraging uh, recovery dollars to, to get a handle on that work. And as I mentioned previously, uh, I think a fairly exciting opportunity to really move the needle on not only those test results, but just the overall quality of the education system is uh, new district quality standards and basically just really strengthen the regulatory uh, framework that will provide greater public assurance on both the quality and equity of our education system. Um, policy priorities, and I'll sort of wrap on this slide, uh, be open to some more questions. Um, policy priorities going into legislative session in education. As I mentioned, the CT funding system, we're anxiously awaiting that report to come back. Uh, we've been doing some work with national partners on computer science, and we think uh, this is an area 
Uh, we could make some improvements as a state uh, to put a priority on computer science as a requirement for students, but also to engage some of our businesses in the state to help us plan how to improve computer science education. Basically, computer science nationally is emerging as a discrete academic discipline like math or science. Computer science is essentially starting to stand alone um, on its own merits as a discrete academic endeavor. Uh, we want to strengthen adult education. Uh, we have, again, here a mixed delivery model. We think we can make some progress here. It has to be a, a part of this sort of integrated coherent model between CTE and higher education. So there's some work there we uh, think would be a, an important priority. School safety is emerging uh, as part of a larger initiative on violence prevention, um, but we'll be bringing forward some recommendations on basically to shift uh, what have been recommendations on school safety to make them more requirements. Um, we're at that point, I think, as a state, uh, you know, I look back on my career as a principal and a superintendent, uh, maybe 15 years ago, we started to think about physical security buildings, and then that changed into planning all hazards planning, and then more recently, we talked about behavior threat assessment. Uh, all three of those things, physical security, planning, and behavior threat assessment, essentially have just been recommendations for schools. We've had a lot, if not most schools, participate in those activities, but we think it's imperative now that we move forward and start requiring these. It's basically, safety is non-negotiable. Um, we want to continue to make progress on anti-hate curriculum and racial equity policy. We uh, introduced some ideas on this last session. Uh, you might be familiar with our mascot policy initiative. Again, not imposing from the state what needs to happen, but the state has an interest in anti-discrimination and promoting equal and high quality education for all students. Uh, we don't want to necessarily alleviate local districts of their responsibility in that regard, uh, but as our mascot policy example, we can provide some guardrails for locals so they can at least have a framework to have those conversations with the community. And then lastly, uh, simplification of home study. Um, I would almost qualify this as sort of a technical uh, correction to a certain extent. We uh, we struggle inside the agency to have capacity uh, to manage all the different policy initiatives you put forward. Um, so we're always looking out for areas where we can simplify. Um, home study sort of stood out. Right now, our home study approach is very uh, labor intensive. We have a lot of labor intensive work that we have to do inside the agency to manage it. And then when we started to look around the country, and particularly in other New England states and Northern New England states, we found out our policy is incredibly more complex than what other states do. So we think there's an opportunity as a win-win, uh, simplify it uh, for the parents and for the communities, but also create more capacity inside the agency by creating a policy framework that's easy to administer, more easy to administer. So I think that's all I have. Uh, turn it over to Tori in a second on workforce. Um, any questions? Yeah. I got a workforce question. Have you, uh, are you familiar with the Fruits of Futures program? Yes. I think there's... I know a relative of mine came out of the Army and he worked for the NWO. Yeah. Um, have we ever done anything to try and approach uh, what the Fruits of Teaching program in the military? We, we have not, I think we've had a really, you know, as unfortunate or, or fortunate result of the pandemic, we've collaborated a lot more with pretty much every department and agency, including the National Guard. You know, they were key players in our ability to deliver test kits and vaccines. So those connections are really strong in the state. I would point to it again as an example, as a small state, how we can get some stuff done here, which is really exciting. Um, but that labor analysis that I pointed to, we were hiring that outside firm to, to quantify what is our education workforce issues. That's like step one. Step two is to have them look at our regulations. If we're not doing enough regulatory, if we have barriers to people entering the teacher workforce, we want to identify those. The third thing we're having them do is to do an environmental scan across the country to identify precisely programs like that. So if there are programs out there that other states are doing, we want to identify those. And then this through this report, we will then surface some recommendations for you to consider as possible ways we can improve both our recruitment and retention of our education workforce. It's going to be really important, as you know, with, you know this is an integrated policy space with social services. These areas, you know, to, to Commissioner Harrington's data, uh, people aren't necessarily being enticed to social service professions right now for pay for a number of reasons. Um, we're going to have to figure that out. And uh, in education in particular, um, you know, we what's emerging, for example, as a national model is this idea of grow your own. We know students, particularly in rural states, are interested in living and working in their communities because they like the quality of life that they grew up in. 
uh, we need to create a more uh, clear pathway for them to to go into education jobs in their communities. You know, so reaching out to people that might want to be paraeducators, helping them become teachers, helping them become principals. So there's some good stuff we can do in that space. So hopefully we'll get some some of those ideas surfaced through the workforce study. There's a question over here. Yes. Going back to page 11, your expansion of remote learning capacity. Right. What, what age and grades are you talking about there? Yeah, really K through 12. Um, we, we started, particularly with the pandemic in, um, you know, I think traditionally re remote learning has been dedicated to high schools because remote learning was organized around courses. And this idea of a course is really a high school thing. If you think about your elementary school experience, you had a class, right? You had a single teacher probably who taught you math, reading, and so forth. Um, when the history on remote learning really started with this idea of a course, so we can offer courses online. Uh, but more recently, particularly as we got into year two of the pandemic, we started to make more investment in the elementary space. Because you know when we start thinking about kids in grades K through three, for example, though remote learning isn't probably that appropriate for kindergartners, but we start thinking about that grade span of K to three, a lot of the learning they do is important skill development. So math, reading skills. And there's a lot we can do with remote learning that isn't course related, but it's good tutorial backup. So there's a lot of gaming going on inside of virtual learning where kids can practice, for example, fractions on their own. We can use it inside the classroom. So there's increasingly more application for virtual learning at the K-12 or through K through eight as well as high school. But I would just say as a, high, as a state, as a rural state, um, we're, we're a bit behind in the use of technology and virtual learning in K-12 education. So it's something I think we, we're really committed to making more progress in. And I think another area to think about uh, back to CTE policy, career technical education, we have a lot of kids that I think of in my neck of the woods, I live in Manchester, but uh, Rutland, I know we have some folks here from Rutland. Uh, the Stafford Technical Center has 11 different receiving high schools. And a better part of what they what that means is those kids for half a day are in their home high school, then they commute to Stafford. And Representative McCoy is here. She knows, you know, you're out in Pulteney, that's that's a hall. And Stafford then has to coordinate the academics with all those different sending high schools. And their academic programs are totally different to a certain extent. So the idea of using virtual learning in the CT centers for students to, to maintain academic progress, you know, so they could take their core academics so they don't have to spend all the time on the road going back and forth. I think has a lot of merit for us as well. So um, bottom line is we need, we need to keep making those investments in remote learning so it becomes more um, available to everyone and everyone starts to understand the application of it. It wasn't just a pandemic thing. Uh, we jumped into it in the pandemic because we had to, but there's more we can be doing as a state in remote learning. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Secretary. Okay. Just because I know remote learning for a lot of us to get kids can be a very Triggering word, right? Um, we're trying to balance because at home when we were at work, we're not advocating, we're going back to no, that, yeah, and that's, we're saying, what can we yeah. be doing to leverage technology right. to kind of level the playing field of offerings for students across the state? Yeah. <laughs> and I, no, yeah, that's a good, I mean, people think about it now, it's a trigger word from the pandemic, right? Um, but I think some of you know, I taught when I was principal up in Canaan for 15 years. Um, so Canaan's pretty far away. You know, we put the R in remote learning. Um, we used to say we did everything through remote learning, even driver's education, not the driver's part. Okay. But we literally, yeah, not the driving part, but we did everything through remote learning up there. And we offered conversational Chinese, but, you know, rural places around the world really understand the importance of bringing a, a 21st century curriculum. So it isn't about the pandemic. It's about really just getting, taking advantage of this significant opportunity and unprecedented funding to catch up and make some progress and think about more flexibility and more options for kids. Exactly. I think really yeah. expanding the options that you could have if you could do more online learning yeah. a Latin course sure. not offered in your high school could be a really exciting thing that you could offer students. So in the interest of time, um, Tori and I are going to try to wrap this up and bring it home. Um, and again, if folks have other questions based on anything you've heard tonight, um, I'm in the State House every day. I think most of you here know where to find me. Alex, mostly Tori, and Secretary French and Commissioner Harrington are too. So again, if you think of more questions, um, again, you can tell. So uh, Tori, why don't you kind of bring us home in terms of when we talk about the rest of the spectrum here in terms of training, uh, workforce development, um, more or less after you exit high school. 
Right. So everything that we talked about today, I think we need to think about it on a continuum and I'll try to be brief because I know I don't have much time. Um, but the ideas of connecting education to our workforce crisis makes a lot of sense because building an education system that's incredibly strong cradle to career is probably our best long term strategy at creating a sustainable feed into the into the labor force as well as attracting new families here. But that takes time. Clearly, the kid walking up on the bus is not going to be going to work next week. So we have to think about some of the data that Commissioner Harrington shared, um, which kind of shows that there's some need for immediate corrective action. Um, so just, you know, summarizing, you know, all of our counties in Vermont have seen labor force decline. We have significantly more jobs open than we have people to fill them. So you know, and wages are increasing substantially, as you all know, um, that, you know, we all hear about the bagel shop in Burlington paying $25 an hour, right? So our approach has to be tailored both to improving our existing workforce system, but also getting new folks engaged in the workforce system. So just as a high level, our vision is investing in our current workforce, retaining more of our high school and college graduates, recruiting more working families into the workforce, and then continuous monitoring and improvement to ensure that the system and the money is being spent efficiently and effectively. So I'll go through this quickly, just in the interest of time, but I think all of you know that workforce development touches almost every single committee, probably in the legislature, and every single agency in the state of Vermont. Everything could be considered workforce. Here, what we're just focused on are those who are really involved in kind of the nuts and bolts of the actual service delivery. But I think it's important to touch on what um, Secretary French said about how things are siloed. Um, it's often harder to get workforce packages through because some of it might be going through healthcare, some of it might be going through commerce, some of it might be going through appropriations. So it's all completely, you know, separate through the legislative process and we need to make sure that we're focused on it from a 50,000 foot view. So we've got our government agencies. So if you think Department of Labor, that's like meat and potatoes of service delivery, that's internships, work-based learning, actually connecting folks to jobs, agency of education, our education and training, Hireability Vermont, which does um, uh, work with folks who are disabled, and then ACCD, which does a lot of our marketing and connecting with businesses and Vermont training program. Education and training, again, you probably know who all of these folks are. I don't need to explain that to you. And then private and local partners. I just want to preface by saying there are far too many to include on this list. So if your favorite organization is missed up here, that's not a slight. It's just these are some examples of the folks that we work with. And then the nexus between all of them is the State Workforce Development Board. So every person here has a seat at the table, has a way to connect with everyone because the system is so large and our tentacles are so large and there's so many different folks investing in this space, there needs to be one place for all of us to coordinate our efforts. And so that's kind of where the Workforce Development Board fits in. And then the other piece of it is that our funding is a little bit different. I mean, everyone gets state and federal funding, but I think when you're thinking about workforce funding, our state funding is for our top priorities. So recruitment, retention, training, wraparound services, and business supports. And then we've got federal funding, which some of you have probably heard of WIOA or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is really focused on making sure that we don't leave anyone behind in the workforce. So that's our low income, marginalized, disabled adults, disadvantaged youth, and unemployed workers. And then of course, again, there's too many to name, but there's a lot of nonprofit and private investment. So the idea behind our workforce strategy is making sure that we're using the federal sources to the best of our ability and then using the state funding to catapult us further. So we've done a lot of work and I'm gonna go through with the, uh, each of the issue areas. We've worked with the legislature very well on investing in workforce. So in the past, we've invested a lot in CTEs, trades training, internships, work-based learning and career placement. We've done a lot for regional workforce development and we've invested a lot in training and upskilling. Um, our new opportunities for growth where we can build upon this work would be to modernize our apprenticeship program, further invest in more work-based learning because we're seeing how effective it is for younger Vermonters and folks trying to have a career change, and then expand on the job training programs. 
For retention, we have done a lot in this area, especially in the healthcare sector. Um, so again, just going through some of the work that the legislature and our administration have done, loan repayment for some of the critical occupations to the tune of hundreds of millions, um, investment in youth employment and training, expanding work-based learning um, in our education system again, and then tuition reimbursement for upscaling and training. Um, so some of our new opportunities that we're focused on is kids who are in foster youth, um, figuring out a way to create good career pathways for them into the workforce or higher education, further investment in trade scholarships and advancement grants, um, and then again, further investment in upskilling workers at our higher ed institutions, whether that's in the Vermont State College System or at UVM. On recruitment, I know this one gets a lot of flack from people in and outside of the State House, but I want to preface this by saying it's not just asking people to move here. This is also about engaging folks who are currently in Vermont who are not engaged in our workforce. So for the first two, you know, we're talking about, again, the hundreds of millions we've invested in re recruiting for critical occupations and relocating families to Vermont. Those two really hit at the fact that we, again, do not have enough people to fill our jobs. And again, also modernizing licensing requirements so that folks who have licenses in other states would be, you know, it's easier for them to come here and use that. But it also means re-engaging folks who have left the workforce for one reason or another. So that could be an older worker with a returnship program where they're able to get back into the workforce part time. That could be investing in the incarcerated population, giving them rehabilitation and a pathway to success. And also giving folks who have been formerly incarcerated kind of a second chance um, to get back and earn and be a part of the workforce. So our new opportunities for growth and one that I find very exciting is addressing the benefits clip for wraparound services. We wanna make sure that folks are not having to make the tough decision between losing a specific suite of services and $10 more a month by taking a job. So we wanna you know, focus on eliminating or at least alleviating where we can the benefits clip. Um, expanding workforce training for incarcerated individuals, continued support and marketing relocation efforts for um, tourism and marketing, um, a significant investment in resettling refugees and placing them into communities and giving them the support services that they need, and then also providing affordability and tax relief for Vermonters. And then finally, um, continuous improvement of the system. I know this is something that we've had conversations with the legislature about for a very long time. Um, previously, some of you may have heard of the SOCWED, which is the Special Oversight Co Committee on Workforce Expansion and Development, I think that's right, <laughs> um, which essentially is reviewing, has contracting with someone to review all of our workforce assets and see how we can deliver services more effectively on a regional basis, statewide, and make sure that we're not really missing any huge gaps here with our coordination. And then obviously we have um, a unified state plan that we submit to the federal government just on our federal funding. So our new opportunities for improvement this year, the State Workforce Board is very focused on data monitoring and continuous improvement. So looking at the metrics that we track in the state plan, but also the similar metrics of how many people are getting placed into jobs with our state funding, consistent stakeholder engagement. So as you may know, we go around the state for ARPA, um, listening tours, but also the state workforce board tours the state um, to talk to businesses in all 14 counties and would, be, would love to hear from any folks that are um, from your constituencies. Um, ultimately, the implementation of the um, advisory commission's um, recommendations to improve the system and then ultimately, um, you know, working on managing all of our workforce systems so that there's no wrong door and if you call one agency and they're the wrong place that you get immediately transferred to the right place for you and then everyone can get the services that they need. So just to wrap that up, I think one thing I'll say is that we understand that workforce is much more than just these programs. As I said, it's housing, it's childcare, it's education, it's quality of life. So, you know, we believe that all of those things tie nicely into this, but our main focus is making sure that one, we have an incredibly strong system, but two, we're also attracting more people to live in Vermont.
center of injury is front and back. Uh, so related to the workforce specifically, we can pull you, so we have a need for immediate threat doctor decision that we can call the data out. Uh, we're, we're all nationwide, we're all facing relatively low unemployment rates. So essentially, we're all feeding from the same trough. We're all trying to get the same worker. And I'm wondering if the state has considered um, uh, motivating our federal representatives, our senator, senators, and our congressmen to utilize H2B visas for temporary workers coming um, into the U.S., which is currently capped federally at 63,000 people for the whole country. And these are these are visas for labor shortages, which we identify and are, are validated by the government. I'm just wondering why we're not calling that weather. So I can't speak to, I haven't spoken with anyone from our federal delegation, but I have spoken with the folks at the National Department of Labor about this. This is something we hear a lot, um, especially from those in agriculture. Um, so it's something that it's an ongoing conversation, but obviously it's not something we have the power to unilaterally change, but um, we agree with you uh, in, in an essence that we need to make sure like that cap should be um, increased, especially for a smaller state like us who needs to help. Reached out about increasing the number of refugees different than H2B visas um, that Vermont can resettle and that we'd like to have located here. Um, so some some limited success. Um, obviously, the pandemic over the past few years put a halt on a lot of things. But the H2B visa area is one that we would love to explore with more with you, and it is something that we should be engaging our congressional delegation on and seeing what we can do on that cap. So Senator, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Any other questions for yes? Rep Foss, how are you? Foss from Wixtech, thank you. Um, I would like to get a little bit more information as to how you are going to address the benefits clip. Uh, more to come on yeah. Friday <laughs> yes. in the governor's uh, budget. Nice job. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I'm glad for it and I'm all with you on that come on Friday. Um, we've all heard those anecdotal stories, right, where people are like, you know, I can't take that extra um, $10 an hour or I can't work that extra day because if I do, I might lose my benefits and then that's not financially viable for me. So something we've talked about for a long time as a state, you know, how can we smooth that? Um, and we're proposing one uh, small, moderate, I, I'm excited about it, but step in that direction. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Have a great evening. Thanks for being with us. And uh, again, let's have more questions.